Um, so yeah, uh, that's a, a small window on some of the pain, some of my confession. I've been doing something called microservices for far too long. And um, I noticed in a few things in our industry, we, we follow some patterns. We follow this pattern I call the hangover. And that something comes along and you go, oh, sounds good. Actually, that could solve my problems, all of them. It could be languages, it could be frameworks, it could be whole architectural styles like microservices. And usually some clever person on the stage who is not going to tell you what went wrong, <laughs> unlike me, um, tells you that this is a good thing to do. You should go in this direction. This is what we did to succeed. And they rarely tell you all the nasty stuff that went with it. Um, and so with microservices, we are, we've had this sort of experience. We had it with Agile as well. I call it, used to call it the Agile hangover. It's where everyone goes, oh, let's go Agile. Let's do that. Let's spend a lot of money. I used to be a consultant, and this is what I used to hear. It is music to a consultant's ears, I, I warn you. I'm going to share some evil now. <laughs> okay, it's when someone phones you up and says, yeah, we've done this Agile transformation. You go, yeah. For two years. Ooh. And, you know, we could do with a little help figuring out why it's better now. <laughs> and you have to sort of sit back and go, where were you going with it in the beginning? There must have been something you were aiming at. Somebody got the budget from somewhere. <laughs> and it's similar with microservices. It's similar in lots of things. But microservices in particular is a bit of a criminal in this space because it's something, if you aren't doing it already or if someone hasn't mentioned it to you, then where have they been? Everyone's doing it. All the cool kids are doing it, apparently. And a lot of people are doing it marching towards the same problem, which is the hangover coming back, which is the phone call that other consultancies will get, which is where someone says, I've been doing microservices for a while. Yeah? Yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd like you to come in and do a review of why, you know, why things are better now. <laughs> and you go in and you find out, no, they're not. <laughs> You've just made something that was really brittle and hard to change, really distributed and hard to change. <laughs> And that's primarily because people forget the reasons we're doing these things. But it's also because right now in modern software development, we have a great situation and a very bad situation. We have a wonderful world and a painful world. We have a wonderful expanse of riches in tools, polyglot programming. You can mix it all together now. You feel like a cook. And you're possibly making the same omelette, which is awful. But yeah, you can do all these wonderful, wonderful tools out there for source code control, right? although there's pretty much two that are dominating. Source code control, um, issue trackers. I'm not going to say the J word, just saying. <laughs> I hate when people say, I, I, you, yeah, they use it as the same word, right? And it's, no, it's not. There are others. So issue trackers, there's dozens of these things out there. And I noticed that we are, some of the, part of the hangover that I want to share with you, some of the therapy session today, is about navigating that morass of different tools as a modern software developer, as a person who would much rather be playing guitar on his motorcycle than, than necessarily trying to figure out what window in what browser actually is going to tell me what I need to know. And so I'm going to share some of that with you. I've got a few slides to back me up on this. I don't do a lot of slides, but sometimes I have them. So let's uh, see if I can find them. Not there. Not there. Oh, there it is. OK, so it's not really a no slides talk. <laughs> it's some, some slides. OK, so they're going to back me up, hopefully, on this. And so first of all, what is the challenge to modern software development? What is the thing that I'm complaining about? What's the thing I'm showing? Because I'm, I'm not going to go on about Agile today. And I'm, I'm not going to go terribly on about microservices, although they do have what I call an amplification, amplification effect. You know, not a good way, either. Not like these great things here. Amplification effect of all the problems. Everything gets a lot harder and worse. <laughs> When you, do, when you make certain choices. Um, but if you distill it back down, what is it, as a modern software developer, what is the challenge? What's the modern software developer's issue? And first of all, I'd like to explain that by telling you a little story. If you've heard this story before, I apologize. Not that it's a bad story, just that you're going to hear it again. But I, I would like you to do something that very few audiences do for a speaker on stage. I want you to trust me. <laughs> See, normally, I'd ask all the lights to go down. But it's a little awkward in here. I think we'd have to see lots of people running around trying to find switches. So instead, what I want you to do is I want you to shut your eyes. 
don't worry, I'm not going to run around and do selfies behind you, although, <laughs> although obviously the thought occurred. <laughs> Can't deny that. But um, I'm going to tell you, so, and the reason I'm going to tell you stories, I want you to feel the challenge. I'm gonna f I want you to feel part of, the biggest part in my, in my world of the problem. Okay? So I want you to shut your eyes now, if you trust me. If you don't, we have trust issues, it's fine. <laughs> so just shut your eyes for a moment, if you, if you will. Um, and I'd like to tell you this story. Okay. It's around sprint 10. And you're feeling great. Everything has gone to plan. The stakeholders are happy. The customers are happy. Your teammates, they're all happy. Life is good. And you're sitting there on your Harley Davidson going across the South Downs in the sun. In the sun! In England! <laughs> it's that good a day. <laughs> it's that rare a day. Um, the birds are in the trees. It's wonderful. You get into, into work and you can feel the buzz in the room. Everyone is feeling good. It's happening. This is the project. This is the one that we talk about on stage for the rest of our lives. OK. So you go into your stand-up meeting, and you do what anyone sensible does at that point, which is sit down. <laughs> and once you've got past the inevitable status updates of the world, you know, what, have you did, what did you do yesterday, what am I doing today, sort of stuff, you get onto the meat of it, which is usually what's blocking me, what do I need help with? But you can still feel the buzz. Yes, there are challenges, but they're good. We can handle them. We're together. We're a team. And you can't help but think, this time, this time, we've got it right. And then, <laughs> the senior stakeholder in the room utters the one phrase you've been dreading. I just like one, small, change. And at that moment, you go through several emotions. <laughs> the first emotion is anger. How dare you change your mind? I can cancel the sprint on you. I can do that. It's in the book. <laughs> How dare you? But it's not the first emotion that's interesting. It's the second one that's the most interesting. Because uh, that second one is guilt. You see, you're supposed to be an agile software developer. <laughs> and agility actually really distilled down to only means one thing embracing change, and you can't. Right, you can now open your eyes if you've been kind enough to shut them. That emotion, I just want to get you in that moment, because that's where I got time and time and time again. And so it was highlighting to me the main problem we, do, we have as software developers, modern software developers, which is we tend to assume that we're building the right thing. Worse than that, we tend to assume that other people know what it's supposed to be. <laughs> so I would like you to adopt, first part of the therapy session, is I would like you to adopt a little mantra, which is, we don't know what we're doing, <laughs> they don't know what they want, and that's situation normal. <laughs> I, I used to work on fast jets. You think they know what they want, really. It's got to be a jet, move fast. Good, pretty much done. But no. It's always about change, and it's, and it's crazy how often we design software assuming we know what we're doing, assuming that we have, it's, it's an inevitable march towards the right thing, whereas in fact it tends to be a meander through all the wrong things <laughs> on the way to possibly something that might vaguely be right. But we don't design that way. We design like we think we know what we're doing. So that's the first little message I want to leave you with, really. Something to think about this week is how would you design differently if you accept the fact that we don't know what we're doing and they don't know what they want. And that's normal. OK, with that in mind, though, we do actually have a lot more problems to the challenge of modern software development. And a lot of that comes down to what I call cognitive overhead. You see, the biggest blocker against change in software is you. Not you personally, but us. Generally, our comprehension of a system, our ability to get this little chunk of gray matter to actually grok what we're doing in a world where we don't know what we're doing is <laughs> pretty hard without introducing huge amounts of cognitive overhead at the same time. 
I'm lucky enough to have written a head first book. Has anyone read a head first book at all? Anyone raise your hands if you've bumped into a head first? They're a bit like Marmite, love or hate, which is why they're bestsellers, bizarrely. <laughs> if you love or hate them, apparently they, they sell well. Um, so I wrote a head first book, and one of the things you notice if you ever bump into these books is they're full of images and pictures, which again is part of the Marmite experience. And one of the things you're taught when writing those books is to think a lot about what's in the reader's brain at any given moment in time. Because there's something called the crap filter. Okay, as humans, we have a crap filter. I feel like we're all adults here. I can actually drop that C word here. Not any other, just that one. <laughs> the crap filter. And the thing about the crap filter is what's happening is when you're reading a book or a piece of code even, or a piece of design, your mind is saying, I need to know this. I've got to understand. This is important to me. Unfortunately, your mind isn't the thing that learns anything. It's the brain that's sitting there that's trying to do that. And the brain is not interested at all, unless it is forced to find it interesting. So the brain's got this crap filter. It sits there and goes, okay, I, I know you want to read this passage in this book, but am I going to die if I don't? No. You know, am I going to eat? Am I going to get food? Am I going to get reward for this if I know this particular paragraph in, you know, C sharp, whatever, or C plus plus, whatever, right? Am I going to am I going to eat? Well, maybe, maybe you might eat eventually, but brains don't really understand eventually very well. And the last thing is, am I going to be able to procreate? <laughs> if you are writing the sorts of books that help with that, good on you, but certainly my technical books are not. And so I couldn't really throw that one in the mix. <laughs> so anyway, th this is what the brain's doing. It's sitting there going, this is not interesting to me. And there's a way you can help the brain to ignore things, which is by increasing the cognitive overhead of the problem. The best way to do that in your code and design is to sit there and say, here's five things I want you to think about. You're screwed. Right? That's it. The brain's checked out. Not <laughs> brains can deal with one thing at once at best if you're lucky. Um, so, yeah, one thing at once. When we talk about single responsibility principle in software, we do it because we're human. Okay? And the brain is not going to deal with it if we say, these are the three things you need to worry about. In fact, it is really just one at a time. Okay, with that in mind as well then, let's look at this challenge in a little more detail. Okay, so this is kind of what we want to do in software. Whenever we're at home or, you know, early on in our career, when we're sitting there in a classroom, this is what we think we do. Okay, we're in some sort of IDE, perhaps, or a text editor of your choice. I won't get into those walls. <laughs> okay, so you're sitting there, you're looking, at, you're looking at code, right? It's all about the code. This is what I want to do. I want to code. Even my daughter knows this. She's eight years old. She wants to code. She does not want to be playing with all these other tools that go around. I want to code, Daddy. Why can't I code? No, you've got to go and find your issue tracker first. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> And this is actually where a lot of this came from, is I was sitting there going, my, my daughter was sitting there going, is this what you do for a living, Daddy? And I was like, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of hoped. Um, but, you see, the problem is we don't just do that. We end up with source code repositories we have to go and navigate. There are links on these slides, so I'll put the slides out on Twitter or something later on. You can click on the links, and all it does is search for all the source code repositories out there that you could choose from, that you might need to go and navigate from. Um, software quality control tools. We have a plethora. We have to check those too. In fact, this is how my routine goes in the morning. I launch my, uh, my machine, hopefully, if it works, and the first thing I'm doing is not looking at code. I'm looking at all these other things. I've got to organize my work. Someone's got to tell me where my issue tracker is, and, and heaven forbid if my issue tracker is spread across several repositories. It gets even more interesting. I then have to check out CI and CD pipelines and find out which things are marching towards production fastest and how and why. And generally, you end up with a lot of these things as soon as you start amplifying things through microservices. And it goes on. <laughs> there is so much stuff I don't want to care about. <laughs> this isn't why I got into software. I don't want to know about Docker. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> it doesn't excite me. <laughs> I think it, it's OK if it excites you. That's all right. <laughs> You'll be, you have a lucrative career. It's fine. <laughs> but it's not what got me <laughs> into it. And then it gets worse. You see, what happens is we do all those things. We have all of that stuff to, to get in our heads and grok before we can even get any work done. But then it gets a whole lot worse because someone says, now you've got more responsibility. 
You're not just looking at your code and looking at your CI CD pipeline. Now you've got to understand what's happening in production. Yes, you write it, you run it, you panic. <laughs> and so you have another collection of tools to check out. And it becomes a nightmare for your brain <laughs> to do anything at all. So then we do microservices to make the whole thing easier, <laughs> which just amplifies the problem. Now I've got multiple of everything. <laughs> Well, it does help, don't get me wrong. If you do microservices well, you can build systems that can adapt. That's kind of the point. Speed and ability to change. If anyone sells you on anything else being microservices, <laughs> ignore them. <laughs> also, the term microservice is a terrible one because it gets you thinking about completely the wrong thing. I don't care how big your services are. In fact, no one does. <laughs> Not even people who do microservices really care. What matters is, what can you do with your system that you couldn't do before? Ideally, you can change it quicker than you did before. If you've not got that, then yes, you might have done what someone would call microservices, but what you've actually ended up building is a distributed system that is going to be slower to change, which is pain incarnate. So microservices don't solve any problems. They just generally make the problem bigger because we value speed of change. We value you know, being able to adapt our system which is a good thing, but at the same time, we've amplified the cognitive overhead of the whole game. <laughs> By any number of magnitude, frankly. Okay, and this is one of the little epiphanies <laughs> I had. In software development, I used to notice that certain keys on the keyboard get damaged quickly. Okay, usually when you're angry, it's like escape, um, or delete, you know, little keys like that. I found now Alt-Tab <laughs> seems to be getting a lot of grief because I'm trying to switch between things all the time, which is also what my brain's doing. And this becomes a real challenge for me. Every morning I have to lo launch up all of the browser windows that I need to find everything. And then I realize I haven't, I've missed one. I'm going to have to go and find that one now. And yes, you can streamline it and you can make it better for yourselves, but it's still going to be tabbing around. You've still got to think about where you're going. It's not fun. Fun was in the IDE. Fun is just one of many windows now. <laughs> and the rest of them are not fun. <laughs> OK. So we had this embarrassment of riches in modern software development, and, and it's good. Um, but now it's time to kind of redress it and figure out what we really wanted. Because it's a cognitive overhead problem. We need to understand, this is, this is kind of the thing, I, the big epiphany I had, is I'd like to know what I should notice when I'm working with my systems, okay? I've got microservices that at any given moment in time, multiple of them could be marching their way to production. I'd like to know what I need to know. I don't want to know everything that's going on, thank you very much. If anyone shows me yet another Hystrix dashboard, I will scream. <laughs> it's not telling me what I could do with that, it's just saying, ha ha ha, stuff. And that's not very helpful. So I need to know what to notice. I need to know where to notice it. Ideally, right where I am right now would be good. Oh, admittedly on stage, perhaps less so. I don't really want a little production warning popping up saying, press this button now to make things better. <laughs> Although that would be a great demo. <laughs> um, but that's what I want to know, where I should notice it. I don't want to have to think about it so much. It's back to that old mantra of don't make me think. I need to f figure out what additional information I need to make a decision. And I need all this to happen quickly. I need to know what I should be doing next. In this world of multiple screens, multiple systems, what, just understanding what I need to do next is kind of the goal, and it's hard. And to the rescue, right, so we have a savior in this game. Yeah, we do, it's great. Are you ready for it? This is what our industry has come up with to save the day. <laughs> IRC. Um, we've we've realised that we should talk through the machine because that's one of the hardest things to do, and chat is the answer. Now, it's a little tongue in cheek, right? So. Yeah, my initial reaction to this was, whoa, whoa, what I'm doing is taking all these disparate systems and bringing them now into Slack. <laughs> and now Slack is screaming at me. 
telling me all sorts of stuff is happening, Many, much of which I can't make sense of. But it's good that it's telling me. I mean, you've only got to hook it up to, to GitHub or something like that to realize that it's just going to scream at you, stuff's going on. And so then you turn off all the notifications in Slack. <laughs> and you think, no, 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 this is, this is going the wrong direction, boys. So we have to change that up. But I, do, I will come back around to this, right? I do think chat has its place. But we're doing it wrong. We're doing it totally wrong. I don't want more dashboards in yet another tool that I have to check. I don't want that tool to be able to scream at me, particularly in the middle of talks. <laughs> when it's not telling me any, inf any information. I want it to respect those decisions, that cognitive overhead problem. I want to be able to be quicker. I want to be back in the IDE more. I want to be writing more code. Actually, arguably, some of my bosses would say, us <coughs> writing less code might be a good idea. <laughs> but either way, it, it would be nice to be doing more of what I enjoyed doing. So no, it's not really about chat. What it is, <laughs> is it's, it could be about what we can do with chat. And that's, that's what I want to talk about now, really, is that chat, just like microservices, becomes just this noise amplifier. And there's a lot of people running around getting very, very excited about chat. And what we need to do is take a step back and be a bit sensible about this, because we could just make our lives worse, because it's that amplification factor again. <laughs> because this is what Slack looks like. <laughs> I didn't work on that cockpit. I did work on a cockpit. I worked on the, uh, what was it, the Eurofighter, the Typhoon, as it's rebranded. Uh, yes, I'm that old. Um, this one I didn't work on. I think this is an SR-71 or something. It's, yeah, it's a beautiful plane. But the point is, what am I doing here? In the middle of a panic situation, <laughs> what are you looking for? And lots of people get you know, trained how to deal with that, and we could probably train ourselves to deal with the problem of chat when it's just screaming at us. But I don't think the humans really should be the ones that bend to this will. Okay, I think we probably need a bit of help. So we don't want that in Slack, thank you very much. <laughs> please, please don't know. Anyone here working for a chat-based startup? Don't do that. You'll be my friend forever. Okay. It's got to be more than show for a start, right? So if Slack is shouting at me now and telling me that Jira is doing something and my CI CD pipeline is doing something and these many, many repos are doing something and somebody in another part of the world is doing something, even though I didn't know they would, I don't want all that because most of it is just more noise, more showing me. We need something a bit more proactive. And this is the key. This is why I like chat, is if you get it right, it's not about showing stuff. It's about helping people work together. Crazy as it sounds. And now, don't get me wrong, I'm not, not into that idea of everyone has to pair all the time and everyone has to be, it's all about the team, it's all about us. It's not, it's all about me. <laughs> um, no, it's not. But I, I'm also an introvert. Yes, that is an ironic state for a human being on a stage. Um, being an introvert, I work best alone. So most of the agile practices are torture for me. And so collaboration could fit into that bracket. But what I'm saying with collaboration is meaningful collaboration, when it's useful, fantastic. That's what chat could be. But you have to think differently about it. And that's one of the things I've been doing recently for the last year or so, is trying to make chat sensible. And I mean, that word sense is really important. I want to be, able to be sensible so I can do things. So as a modern software developer, I can deal with my cognitive overhead. And I've got a few answers in this space. I'm going to share some of it with you today. I'm just going to talk about it briefly. If you want to know more, obviously come and grab me afterwards. If you want to play the guitar later on, go for it. Um, just don't drop it. It's incredibly heavy. It's a mahogany guitar. You've got to watch out for these things. That's why the strap is so big. It's killer. But if you want to talk to me later on about how I'm doing these things in detail, please do. But I'll give you a quick overview now. This is what I'm doing. All right? I have these things on my mind, which if you've worked in military circles, you actually have a different acronym for these that, that gets banded around a lot, which is essentially observe, orient, decide, act. That's what you want to do as a software developer. When you're trying to navigate all of that stuff, it would be good if something was guiding me through it. 
Even better if it could even make some of those decisions for me. But that's what you want. You want something to tell you what's important. You want something to say, this is important and you need to look this way now. This is now the thing. And then you need some help figuring out what you should do and then you need something to make it really easy for you to do it. And chat can do this collaboratively. So there is a chance. It won't be the saviour of all things. But there's a chance it could help us with that problem. And so I am optimistic, although I am optimistic generally, I'm optimistic that these, some of these things really could be a good answer for us. Do I think they'd be an all end all? No. But I do think when it comes to the cognitive overhead of software development, modern software development, particularly team-based enterprise modern software development, always put enterprise in the term somewhere, it makes it expensive. <laughs> um, yeah, no one works on software, they work on enterprise software because then you get to charge the big bucks. When you have all of that problem that we make for ourselves, I do think some of the modern tools in this space, particularly around chat, could help. But it has to honour this loop. And so what it does, and what I would put out there as being the answer, or one as part of the answer, I suppose, is that if you, in modern software development to defeat your cognitive overhead problem, you do have an opportunity to do collaborative OODA loops. But it's not just a broadcast system. It has to be that collaborative. You can see what's going on, and you can act upon it, and you can see what other people are doing on it, too. So what I really wanted when I was doing this is I want visibility and control of, and, and as much as possible, automation of my software development. This is a bit different. When you think of automation, you probably think of running up Docker instances or something. I think of automation as getting rid of all the stuff I get wrong. You know, that's stuff I have to do, but I, I generally don't do it very well. And I hate doing it when I have to do it. And so what we do is we automate that out. It's stuff that the machines probably could do for us anyway. We want to get our brains back on the software problem. And so as well as collaborating through something like chat, it would be really good if the system itself could do a lot of those things I don't want to do. The example I've got for this is Sprint Zero. Anyone done a Sprint Zero? Or labelled something a Sprint Zero? It's the most anguish and pain you can have in a software development project. Because what you do is you take, you take a piece of wood and you reinvent the wheel over and over again in these Sprint Zeros. And you bring all this stuff to bear on your project. And it's expensive to do. It's painful. And it's almost totally unnecessary because it's pretty much the same every time. And if you get good at it, that's what you do, is you automate the heck out of it so that Sprint Zero becomes, well, we've got it now. You press a button, it's done. So one of the things I look, look at when I'm doing software development, and even when I'm talking to my daughter about it, is I want to automate the heck out of Sprint Zero. Because my daughter's really not going to deal with that. Can you imagine it? Daddy, can I write some Python code? It's always Python. I'm sort of pleased about that. Can I write some Python code, Daddy? Yes, you can. But first of all, we have to spend two weeks. We have to bring together an issue tracker, a CI/CD pipeline, and some cloud stuff. You good with that? Cool. She would just be bored. Of course she would. And we are too. We know we shouldn't be doing these things. But we also know we have to. So we can automate that. And that's, just, that's a low-hanging fruit. There's also a lot of things we have to do that we, we don't want to. I'll give you an example. Microservices. You're not really supposed to update multiple microservices at once. That's kind of not the point. But if you're running a serious security upgrade across your microservices, you might. But when that person turns around to you and says, yeah, we need to update those 200 microservices again and again in your POMs or your, your build systems, and you have to get it right every time, inside you die slightly. And you know you should automate it, but you don't. <laughs> because you just like checking things out and changing code. You look really productive. Um, but actually, we could automate that whole thing. It would, it would be better for me in the chat system if something popped up and says, I see you've got 200 microservices. No, I'm not talking about Clippy here. <laughs> I see you've got a bunch of microservices. I would like to upgrade them, because I think you've got a problem here. And if you click this button, 
I'll submit a bunch of pull requests that you can automatically choose to merge in if you want. That would be cool. And that's one of the things I've been working on, is systems that allow me to do that, because that is getting rid of my cognitive overhead. And all that busy work is gone. And I still get to look productive, because I merge the PRs. <laughs> so this is what it's all about, I suppose. And it's my, my food for thought from this talk, hopefully, is that when you're doing software development, don't accept the multitude of riches or the multitude of pains of cognitive overhead from what you're doing. When you're look, focusing on your code, focus on the reader, because the reader doesn't want several things in their brain at once. Well, actually, they might think they do, but they don't. So think it, at the code level, you can con consider cognitive overhead. At the system level, it gets really powerful. If you are doing something over and over again, and it's painful, consider what I call development automation. I'm not automating the infrastructure here specifically. I'm not automating other bits and pieces. I'm automating the busy work of what I'm doing. And that's what we're doing at the moment on this little style I've worked on, is we're making the busy work go away as much as we can. Streamlining a development process. There's loads of marketing slogans. But it has actually got a real core message here, which is get over this cognitive overhead. It's the thing slowing us down. If you get microservices right, there's a good chance you'll be able to evolve your systems quickly. The problem then shifts to you. If you can't understand and navigate all of these different options and systems and browser windows, then you become the reason things are slower. And then what we do is we automate that stuff so that you don't have to worry about all that. It does take a mind switch, though. It's so tempting to just sit there and go, oh, I know it's 50 microservices, but it'll only be a couple of hours. And I've, you know, I've got a coffee, I'm happy. What I'm trying to do here is it takes a little bit of discipline to do automation of the, at this level. But to actually do it and capture it and give it to someone else so that they can do it next time is awesome. That's where the real amplification of the right thing comes in, where everyone gets a bit faster. So again, take, if you take one thing away from this talk, as a, meet, a way of meeting some of the challenge to the modern software developer, is try to automate what you do. Okay. Think about the OODA loop. How do you expose what you need to know immediately so you can do something about it? And then automate what you're going to do about it. Don't accept that, oh, it's just another build system change. Only another tweak to another XML file. I'll just do that quickly. If it's something you do a lot, if you, so you anticipate doing it again, automate that. Bizarrely enough, if enough of us did that and shared that automation, across the industry, we'd speed up. We actually would. And then, of course, if you actually get it right with the cognitive overhead as well, then everyone gets a chance to be human and speed up too. Okay, I think, um, am I, how am I doing for time? I've got 10. I think I've got 10 for questions. Okay, I'm going to stop there. If you want to see what some of these systems I use look like, say, grab me, grab, grab me a little later on. Even better if you grab me with a beer. So, <laughs> there's a priority order <laughs> to the, the queue. But yeah, if you want to see some of these things in action, come and have a shout with me and we'll, we'll look at some stuff. But the main message, like I say, is try to automate your OODA loops in software development. People will love you for it. Okay? Hopefully that wasn't too broad for the first kickoff of the, of the conference. I hope you have a fantastic conference. The whole Code Club thing, we don't talk about Code Club. Code Club, <laughs> definitely start sponsoring that. That's awesome and really good initiative. So please, please, I want to emphasize that. Um, other than that, if anyone's got any questions for now, At all? I've got to peg somebody. I really want to throw the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I, I used to learn about collateral damage. <laughs> um, 
Is the problem with Sprint Zero, though, the fact that all our tool chains keep moving every single time, so therefore there's no point automating because it's Jenkins 1, now it's Jenkins 2, now it's Team City, now it's .NET, now it's... Yeah, so because it's always changing, um, there's, there's nothing to automate because it's... It's, it's a fair point, right? So every time you, you, you sit down to do something new, everything's different, right? And it's not just that, is it? It's, it's uh, the, even the languages you choose, everything that goes with it. I think this is where the burden actually shifts to the tool vendors themselves to make it much easier to do these things quickly and easily themselves. You know, at the moment, you kind of build your toolkit every time. If you're a craftsman, you'd be sitting there going, we're going to do a new project, we're going to do, build a new table. That's cool. I'm just going to go and make all my tools again. First, and then we'll make the table. I think that's the problem, is at the moment, the vendors aren't thinking about, here's the way you do it, done, right? Just, just click this button, it's all together. Some are, but many of them are still, their little niches, and, it's, and you then have to compose your toolbox every time. So it's a fair point, but I think the onus isn't necessarily on you then to have to adapt it every time. I think the vendors need to start doing a little better in that space. It would be really, really helpful if they did. Thank you. Has that ball got to come back now? Yeah. Watch out. <laughs> That's a better throw. Come on, Russell, you can do that. <laughs> any more for any more? Okay, if that is it, then I wish you a fantastic conference. I'm around all day. If you want to have a conversation with me, please do. Uh, otherwise, have a fantastic conference, and I'll see you around, hopefully. Cheers.